you know, God willing, I'll be playing in the NFL for the next three to five years. I've always wanted to hit 10. I just finished seven. So when I at least hit then uh, 10, but I think I might even be able to hit 11 or 12. So next three to five years, I hope I'm still in the NFL. Um, right now, as you know, I've reached the financial independence goal, what that number is for me. Um, so my goals are, I'm kind of scrapping all my old goals and writing new ones. And, and now I want to, uh, I have a big goal of doubling my net worth outside of, uh, outside of football. Welcome to Coach Carson TV. My name is Chad Carson. You can also call me coach. And this is a channel all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence and doing more of what matters. You are about to see an interview with Devon Kennard, who is an NFL athlete who used real estate investing to create a passive cash flow of $300,000 per year. So we get into his story behind the scenes, some things you might find interesting about NFL athletes and some of the ways they have to learn how to invest their money really quickly, but also a lot of lessons that are applicable to all of us about when you're busy and you've got to learn how to do things on the side while you have a full-time profession. How do you know who to trust? How do you know what types of investments to make? And much, much more. So I think you're going to enjoy this interview. If you like these types of interview, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the little bell so you don't miss anything. Hit the like button, help us spread the word with others, and then enjoy the interview. Hey, Devon, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. Yeah, this is exciting for me. This is, you know, I've had a lot of different conversations on the podcast. Of course, they revolve around financial independence, around real estate. But this is really fun to connect with you on Instagram. You reached out and just getting to learn that you're you're an NFL player, you're a linebacker. So I definitely appreciated that. You've kind of taken linebacker into another level from where I, I took it. But uh, uh, but also you, what, what you've done with uh, with real estate investing and financial independence. So really looking forward to, to talking to you about all this. Um, one thing I want to get started with, I want, I want to jump into your kind of your portfolio and your real estate story, but just so people who can get to know you a little bit better, maybe you could tell a little bit about your background, you know, leading up to college, like kind of up to where you're from, you know, how you, where you grew up, that kind of thing. And then we'll talk about kind of the football career as well. Yeah, I think it, uh, it really starts with my father. He actually played in the NFL. He had a 13 year NFL career really 11 his first two years were in the usfl with like steve young and the la express and then uh went on played 11 years won a super bowl with the cowboys so you know growing up for me i knew i wanted to play football and my parents don't come from the best area in northern california a town called stockton uh some people may know of it it's you know not the best city in the world so you know uh when my dad started playing for the cardinals he he uh, made it home and that's why i was born and raised in phoenix arizona and coming in, coming out of high school, you know, I was the number one recruit in the nation, um, top top player and all that. But my senior year of high school, I tore my ACL, so uh, that was my first in, like injury and like dealing with adversity. And I decided to go to USC. That was my dream school uh, growing up, and I went to USC and uh, felt a, a dealt with a lot of trials. You know, I had some more injuries. I had a really bad hip surgery, uh, and then my senior year, I'm like had a great spring ball, ready to just crush it. And I tear my pec, benching 425 for five reps. On the fifth rep, I, I tear my pec as a true senior. Um, and, you know, I was devastated at the time. And I really had to look myself in the mirror and like, all right, what am I going to do? My dream seems like it's going to, it's, I'm not going to be able to make it. And all of those things, all those, you know, self doubt, uh, self doubt started coming in. But I kind of realized, um, you know, I got to make sure that I find success with or without football. Um, once you determine what what the life you want to have, and and um, I, you know, I decided I wanted to be successful. I wanted to have financial independence, regardless of of with or without football. When I made that decision, I needed to know, all right, what's going to be my other outlet? What are the um, other things am I interested in? And I was lucky enough to have mentors um, going to USC. The alumni is awesome, and uh, you know real estate was something that I gravitated towards and was like, all right, well, I think that's what I'm going to do. And uh, my redshirt senior year, I ended up balling out, um, had a really good year, nine and a half sacks and um, did a lot of good things, put me in a uh, position to get drafted. And uh, I'm one of the few players who can say the day I got drafted in the NFL, I had my uh, undergrad and master's degree from USC. So, uh, you know, tearing my pec, it allowed me to finish my master's degree while I was there. So, um, yeah, so the day I was drafted, I, I had two degrees from USC, obviously, 
paid for through scholarship. So uh, I felt like I had a, uh, a step ahead of, of some people and, and I knew that, all right, I got a, now I'm a fifth round draft pick. I want to play 10, 15 years in the NFL, but I, I don't know how long I'm going to play. So I got to plan accordingly. And that kind of took off with my real estate journey as well. Yeah. I think so many things about your story. I, I really wanted to pinpoint, but one, you know, I think this is pretty, probably true in any any career, any area, but I think the NFL and also college football just kind of it kind of highlights that just any one day, I mean, your your whole trajectory can be changed. I mean, you tore your ACL, you had your you tore your muscle in your chest. I mean, so I mean, all these things like, you know, all of a sudden day one, you're like living large, you're looking good, you're going to go to the NFL. The next day, bam, you have this injury, and you know that could happen to people's careers too. I mean, we all have health is not guaranteed, but it was really interesting how you learned that in college. You're like, all right, I have this wake up call here. I may or may not be successful with football and make money with football. I've got to figure out what, what my base is like. And so you got two degrees, you, you got two degrees before you even left to go to the NFL. And what, what were your degrees in? Why, what were you studying there in college? Uh, I, I got my undergrad in communications and my master's in uh, business management focused on marketing. So I knew I wanted to go the business route. I didn't know exactly where and uh, communication was more so. Uh, I knew I wanted to do a lot of stuff, public speaking, uh, broadcasting. So I took a lot of broadcasting class, public speaking classes, and, and it's uh, you know worked out well for me being able to be in a position where I've been in front of a lot of cameras and, and I feel comfortable in those settings. So uh, that's why I went that route and it's, and it's paid off. We got to get you once you have more time after the NFL, get you into the podcasting YouTube world, man. <laughs> Do some of the self self broadcasting, right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're the one that got me getting a, a podcasting mic and all, and all this equipment now. So I'm like, all right. All right, I might make make this a thing. <laughs> you got it. Now that you got the mic, you got to you got to get that return on investment, right? You got to <laughs> got to do something with it. No, that's cool. Well, so uh, you know, this is this is an interesting part, kind of behind the scenes. Like I, I got right to the level where, like, my junior year in college, I had a really good year. You know, projected maybe like third and fourth round, and then my senior year was like a falling stock. It was like, bam, we our defense is bad. I got injured, so I kind of took the opposite tack where my senior year just kind of fell apart and I didn't, I didn't even get drafted. So I'm curious just behind the scenes, it's just kind of my, my own interest level too. So you're, you're going, you get drafted and you know, most people think, Hey, you've made it once you get in the NFL. My understanding is like, you know, if you're beyond like third, fourth, fifth, fourth, fourth round, you get a good, good contract, but there's no guarantees. Like, it's not like you get like a huge multi-million dollar signing bonus. Like what, what was the, what was the money like when you first start as a first year guy and how guaranteed was that? I mean, did you have, you know, you get some money or do you have to go work hard and still, still make some things happen? Uh, you know, as a fifth rounder, and I was, I, I said I was a glorified sixth rounder because I was an extra compository pick in the fifth round. So the yeah. little bonus pick that the New York Giants had for the fifth round. But when you're drafted that late, there there was signing bonus connected to my contract, but it wasn't significant enough to where they couldn't just cut me in camp if they if they wanted to. They could still cut me and it not be a big deal to them. Um, and that was the reality I was in. You know, a lot of the reports when I was coming uh, coming in and got drafted was, oh, maybe he'll make the team. Maybe he could be a special teamer. We'll see how it how it pans out. And yeah. uh, you know, I, like uh, at one point in my my football career, I, I was number one recruit in the nation at my position. I still hold the state record in sacks in Arizona in high school. I did a lot of things well. Just went through adversity in college. So in my mind, I'm like. I know I could play at this level and, and uh, some injuries happened when I was with the Giants and um, and then I was able to start. So I started as a as a rookie fifth rounder I, um, and, you know, my whole rookie contract, I kind of exceeded what they expected from from me. And uh, I beat the odds. You know, they say football is not NFL is not for long and the average career is three. And I just finished my seventh year and I'm trying to enter my eighth. And, you know, I, I don't take it for granted. Well, first of all, congrats for the hard work you had to put in to make it that happen. Because yeah, I've heard that saying. I've heard different stats like two and a half years, three and a half years. But I mean, the NFL is is mer is merciless. You know, you get in there and they can cut you like that. So, I mean, congrats for that and the, what you've been doing and continue to do. And um, I'm I'm interested from the financial standpoint because I my understanding when you get whether you're, whatever professional athlete you're in or if you're successful in other realms or you you fi you finally make it, you get some money coming in. My understanding is all of a sudden you got everybody and their brother wanting to offer you investments, wanting to say, hey, come invest in this restaurant, come invest in this business. 
And from an NFL player standpoint, I would imagine there's also some concern and some fear because everybody knows that's a two and a half year, three and a half year, potentially career. So what was your mindset when you finally started? All right, I got some revenue coming in. I've got some stability. Like, but wh what am I going to do with this money? Like, did you lean back on some of your business lessons? Where did you go to for advice? I'm just curious where, where your mind was at that point. Uh, you know, luckily having a father who went through it, like I kind of learned from from his mistakes and things he did right as well. And and for me, it was like, I want to learn. And if it's something I can't understand, I'm not investing in it. Because sometimes people come and they have these elaborate business plans and want you to invest in this and that. And, you know, you're right. You get you get proposed with so many investment opportunities and so many people pulling at you left and right. And yeah. and expectations are just so high. They think just because you're in the NFL, you're making millions of dollars. And I want to go ahead and debunk that. You know, every NFL player is not making millions of dollars. Most of them aren't actually. So, um, you know, keeping that in mind. And for me, it was like, I don't know how long I'm going to play. So I need to preserve as much as I can so I can give myself opportunities and and I can have, you know, some leeway. I'm like, I looked at it as, I think I was 23 when I entered the NFL and I was like, I'm blessed enough to make more than most 23 year olds right now. But the problem is, I don't know how long it's gonna last. So I'm gonna save as much as, uh, as much of it as I can and, um, and learn and be ready to invest when I'm ready. So that, that was kind of my mentality. And, it, you know, there's articles on CNBC when, uh, a few years ago, because um, a lot of teammates would make fun of me because my first couple of years, I drove my high school car still in, in the league. And then um, even after I got rid of that, because, you know, it wasn't doing too good in the winter, I ended up working a deal with the dealership in, in New Jersey, and I drove a free car from them for the next two years. So I didn't buy my first vehicle until I hit my second contract and, and went to Detroit. And it was like, that was a uh, you know, that was just a decision I made that, like, it's not an asset. Buying a vehicle is, is a liability, and I wanted to wanted to wait, and that was one of the things that I told myself I was going to do, and I did it. That, that's an uphill battle, man, because I, I know even, uh, you know, when, when people start making money, that car is like that first symbol, like, I made it, right? I, I've got my car. So, I mean, was that another conversation with your dad? Was that you just learned, just kind of thinking about the money and where it was going to go? Like, I'm, I'm just, that, that's, a, that's a big decision. Yeah, for me, it was it was just like, I'm going to have all the opportunity in the world to buy a car down the line, but that's not where I want to spend fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 right now. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of money. I don't know how much money I'm going to have coming in, and I don't know for how long. So I'm going to stretch this thing out. You know, the car I was driving was all I knew. So I was like, it's not a, not a big deal. I don't have to act bigger than I am and keeping up with the Joneses of NFL players and, and all of that. So I just, I just stayed true to who I was and, and was like, man, I want to be 30, 40, 50 years old um, and driving whatever car I want, not 23 and, and doing it. So that was, uh, you know, I've always had that kind of perspective and I think it, it helps me a lot. Yeah, and this isn't just for NFL players too, by the way. This, this is one of like the, the soapboxes I get on every once in a while too. It's like, hey, when you, you get out of college and you're making 100,000 bucks a year as an engineer or a nurse or a doctor or whatever, I mean, almost everybody goes, and you kind of deserve it, right? I, I, get, I want to reward myself because you have worked hard and you have paid off. But man, if you can listen to that kind of wisdom you're talking about, if you can just put it off, I mean, you're going to get to do it. I mean, you're going to all those things you want to do, the big house, the cars, the trips. I mean, you can do all of that. But the longer you can wait and have that compound interest going, that's what you recognize that, hey, I got to invest this money. Otherwise, it it could be all gone. I think I think the biggest flex in the world is being able to buy those things with passive income. Like, you know, hopefully next couple of years, I'm going to be able to buy some ridiculous things, whatever watch I want, whatever car I want. And that's going to be with excess cash flow and passive income, not touching uh, principal. But when you're just spending down your principal, you know, if you, you're coming out of college and you're making $100,000, uh, not to say you can't try to find a nice home to live in and, and things like that, but be, be a little modest at first and save some of that money so you can, all right, what about you making $100,000 and you got a couple thousand dollars of passive income coming in too? Like that, that sounds a little bit better than a hundred thousand dollars. And I got this, you know, 5,000 square foot house and I'm driving, you know, a Range Rover, you know, whatever it is. So it's, it's all in perspective. And like you said, you could do it all just when, when you do it is, is uh, the difference. 
It's the old uh, golden goose and the, the golden goose and the golden egg story, right? That passive income is that golden egg. If you can just wait on the golden eggs, which is the interest and the rental income, and if you can spend that all you want, and the, the golden goose ain't going away, right? I mean, that's Absolutely. that's where you want to be. So, I love it. Um, wh- where was some of the education or some of the specific lessons you learned on? where to invest. So like, you know, we talked about real estate investing, you and I share that, you know, love of kind of putting money in real estate and also other places too. But where did you first start thinking, hey, I think I want to put some of my money into some income generating real estate assets. And why did you choose that? Um, I think one of my main mentors, he's out, out in LA and TM, he w- he used to be a police officer and his wife was a teacher and you know they made 70 to 80k a year and they and now they're over a thousand units in LA and crushing it and that was like I always told myself if they could do that off of 70 or 80k a year then if I can build some type of nest egg why can't I do it you know do the same thing so that's where I originally got the idea and and then once I entered the NFL I started listening to a lot of podcasts reading a lot of books and trying to figure out what way that I was going to get involved. I knew I wanted to do real estate. It was how, when, where, and why, you know, so to speak. So um, I actually went to a seminar in the off season, uh, just a local meetup in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, me and one of my old teammates from USC who was in the league as well. And we went there, met a couple of people, and we found somebody who did turnkey properties in Indianapolis. And he connected me with the, uh, with the main guy who did it. And our first property, we said, let's go in together. It's just just us two. We, uh, it was $87,000 property. We both put 12K in. So, you know, that was still significant money to us, but it was like, all right, we're mitigating some risk. And it was a turnkey property. So the guy we bought it from, he recently just renovated it and essentially flipping it to us. And we're buying it, putting property management in place and just gonna collect, collect the rent. So we, um, we did that and it was a very easy process. You know, we bought the home. I actually put the loan in my name. My credit was a little better than uh, my partners at the time. So I put the loan in my name and um, we just both put in 12K and we started to see, see the cash flow every month. And actually, you know, four and a half years later, uh, this last off season, so about a year ago, we sold that property and, you know, made made a ton of money, made all our money back and some, not even including the passive income um, that we received throughout. So it was, you know, I'm, I got a lucky first story, I guess, or not complete luck. You know, we, we did do our due diligence, but, you know, I hear a lot of horror stories or some people say they kind of um, messed up on their first property. And I can say my first property was a huge success. So yeah. um, that, that kind of got me rolling. And I started to realize our return was, well, was good, but the dollar amount, wasn't adding up for me. So I started buying them on my own. And, um, and I stayed with the turnkey method at at first and, and then just kept that going. I'm curious, Devon, on your first deal. um, I love that it was not it wasn't like a an enormous deal. I mean, obviously 12,000 bucks isn't nothing, right? But each of you're putting 12,000 bucks in. It's, it's kind of like from your perspective, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's kind of like a single in baseball. You know, it's like, I, yeah. I'm just trying to go for a single. Like the thing's a turnkey. It's already fixed up. I'm trying to eliminate some of the risk of having to do it. I know I'm busy with NFL. Like I got a lot of things I can't do, but I got some money. I got some credit. I got some knowledge. So you, you weren't trying to like hit a home run on that first deal. It sounds like you're just trying to like yeah, hit a base hit. Was yeah. the ball roller. I like yeah. I'm a firm believer. You got to get in the game. I, I I know people even today who say they love the real estate idea and they they listen to different podcasts, read different books, and they never pull the trigger on anything. I'm I'm very action based, so it, it just hit the point where it's like this is a s- small investment. If I lost everything on this, it's twelve thousand dollars. I could get out of this home. It, like. I won't, I won't be happy, but you know, it is what it is, but I need to get things rolling. And that was my motivation to do it. And, um, you know, it, it worked out. And so the, and the big thing, you made some money, which you said, you know, it wasn't like game changing money, but you compounded your money a little bit. You t- I'm sure you learned a ton, you built some relationships and now you kind of catapult that into multiple deals. So you kind of fast forwarding yeah. here, you, you did more of those turnkey deals on your own. You started making more money on them. You know, what, what was your, was there a transition point where you said, all right, this is like, this is working pretty well for me. I need to like, I need to put more, more chips on the table here and start putting more into my real estate game. Yeah. So with that first property, it like my, our rate of return was good, but the dollar amount was meaningless with the cash flow. So I'm like, 
this is going to be so hard to scale. So that's where it told me, all right, I need to do this, but I'm going to have to kind of do it more on my own. And I started to make more money in the NFL. So I'm like, okay, my next step was I, st I stick with turnkey because I'm so busy. So I um, made connections in Ohio and Kansas City with turnkey providers. And I essentially started buying properties cash. Now, the pl pluses and minuses of doing that, the positive for me was I had the cash. I had the cash and my return, like the dollar amount was higher by buying cash. So, you know, I don't have any debt. Um, I'm, I'm leaning towards being debt adverse. Like I don't like a ton of debt because I've been blessed enough to make good money that I don't like getting in a ton of debt. So I was like, I'm gonna buy these cash, which is gonna up my cash flow. But the rate of return technically is lower because I got more in the deals. But I didn't care about that because my number this was cash um, that you know, provide on it. Buy these cash about a hundred from there. Cool. Yeah, I love that. So you, you you're focused on cash flow and you, you know, it sounds like you really knew yourself well. Like you, you're aware that, Hey, you know, I, I, I know my time limit. I'm an NFL player. I, I got a lot of commitments. I've got some capital now. And so like going with more of a debt free strategy, turnkey, third party management, like that just that just fit your, your profile. Like you just, you knew yourself well. It's, it's kind of like in football too. Like you got to know your game. You know, if you're, if you're a speed rusher and you, you know, you're, you got quickness, you got to go with those moves. If you're a power guy, you got to go with that. I mean, so it's, you knew yourself, you learned, you compounded your knowledge and here you are. Now you fast forward, you've got several properties and they're cash flowing. And, you know, it, my, my phone broke up a little bit on that last, last point, but did you, at that point, did you start looking into some of these other avenues, like some of the, the limited partnerships and some of the other kind of diversification within real estate? Or how did you kind of take that transition from these turnkey properties where you own them directly to some of these other different avenues? Yeah. So, you know, alongside my, that was kind of my personal investment uh, journey with just doing my own portfolio. But while that was going on, as soon as I got in the league, I, I got lucky. Um, I don't know if you guys will remember um, Peyton Hillis. He was a running back. He was on the cover of Madden when he was with the Browns at one point. He played with me in New York, and he connected me with one of his financial advisors. I always thought he was a pretty bright guy. And um, the financial advisor, you know, I once again, you get, you get uh, proposed with all these investments all the time. So I was very weary, but I liked the guys, got to know them, and they specialized in – um, you know, finding great private equity deals, essentially, uh, mostly real estate back. They showed me, you know, what they do, how they do with the different funds that that they found. And I just did one, uh, my first in, uh, investment with them, uh, they found a, a private equity deal and I became a limited partner in essentially like a funding deal where say you own a huge hundred, uh, or you own a hundred uh, unit building and you needed the financing, but you needed it quickly. You come to this fund, get the cash, and they charge you a really high, um, you know, percentage, and you pay and you pay that. Otherwise, they take over the property. So that was one of the first limited partner deals I got into, and till this day, it's um, it's been giving me off dividends nine, ten, eleven percent at least uh, yearly. And from there, I built I built trust with them, started um, understanding the process more, and now I'm in over 21 uh, syndications essentially and a limited partner in these deals where I, um, I essentially invest in, I'm, I'm, I'm the cash, you know, I come in, I put cash in, and it's uh, very particular with different different funds and people who have expertise anywhere from apartment complexes to senior living centers, hotels, um, all, all kinds of uh, different lanes. And I think that's a good way to diversify for me because it's like, all right, I'm not betting on just one person. It's all these different people who specialize in these, in these different sectors of real estate and I'm investing alongside of them and I'm getting dividends, which is helping my cash flow that, that I talked about. And I also get to participate in, you know, the closing if and when they sell the property and, and all of that. So that, that's been a huge part of my strategy because, you know, when you have cash, it's it, the big thing you're looking for is I wanted to keep it safe, but I want to create cash flow. My big thing was, uh, that's where I feel like a lot of professional athletes and high net worth earners mess up is you make all this money, but you don't have any cash flow coming in. So if you're done playing, now you're spending your principal. 
I'm like, what is the baseline lifestyle that I want for myself? And, you know, like in your book, you talk about it, financial independence. Like, what is that number for me? What is the lifestyle I want for myself and my family? And and I need to go and get that with the cash that I have. Um, so it's bringing in that cash flow. So that that's why I did I do the limited partnerships and and uh, you know the cash flow investing through through turnkey properties because it's established for me that kept that consistent cash flow that now I know I could stop playing football tomorrow and my lifestyle doesn't have to change. It's that uh, I think you called it. I, I read the article you but the interviewed you in Forbes. You called it mailbox money, which I, I love that term. <laughs> it, you know, like there's so many athletes, and this is not just athletes too. This is a lot of people in the financial independence movement. And there's there's kind of a little you know a little fun debate that goes on about hey, I want to own assets that grow and like you know I, I love stock investing too. Like I'm an index fund investor, but I, I'm a big cash flow guy as well because like just like you said, at some point if you want to turn that salary off, whether it's NFL salary engineering salary, nurse, janitor, whatever you, you know, whatever it is, you got to replace that income and you got to have that mailbox money. You got to have that consistent income, particularly psychologically for me. I don't know about you too, but if I, if I'm having to eat into my principal, like psychologically, that is a difficult thing when you're 29, you're 35, you're 40. I mean, you got a lot of years to go. And if I'm having to eat into a little bit of principal here, you know, sell off some stocks, do that kind of stuff. Yeah, maybe the numbers work. Maybe the you know the analysis should work, but I, I would much rather live off that passive income, like you talked about earlier. Live off that mailbox money, never touch the principal, and then keep keep going. I mean, that's is that kind of what your your mentality was as well? Yeah, no, that, I mean that that's pretty much been my strategy from from jump. Is um, once I knew that I have ma I've made enough and I'm making enough to where all right, I if I invest it wisely, I'll be able to create cash flow for myself. It was like bare minimum what's going to be how much do i need to pay my mandatory bills and then i hit that and i'm like all right i want what's the lifestyle i want i need to know how much money my family and i need for our lifestyle to stay the exact same from today till forever and i i found that number and you know i can say now this year like this is the first year i've hit it and i plan on hitting it consecutively now so now my my goals can become bigger because it's like it's a sigh of relief. I know my lifestyle doesn't have to change anymore. So now, now it frees my mind and, and uh, you know, my goals to where, all right, what do I want to do next? You know, both on the field and off. And uh, it's, that's a relieving uh, feeling. And I, I wish more people, especially athletes and the people I'm around would take that perspective. Like, you know, minimize your expenses, but decide what the life is that you want to have for yourself and go and get that in passive income. Cause then it doesn't matter if, Whoever your boss is, it doesn't matter about um, coronavirus. It, none of that matters if you know you're bringing in this amount of cash flow on a monthly, yearly basis. Um, it's a, it's a feeling that I wish everybody could experience. It's a game changer. I, I mean, it really is, and it's it's really cool that this is the year you hit it as well. And um, I know we're both fans of the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, or at least, but we like everybody. We've kind of read that early on, and you even you went on the podcast with uh, with Kiyosaki, which is pretty cool. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, but basically, what you're talking about is you're leaving the rat race, right? I mean, you're you are getting like in that cash flow game. That I, I bought the cash flow game to play with my kids this last year. We, that's kind of been one of our coronavirus things. Is we uh, we play the cash flow game. You got the balance sheet, and you got to invest in real estate, or you got to buy stocks. And so my daughters are learning kind of what's a good investment, what's not a good investment. It's, it's one of the best ways I've ever seen to learn this concept that you're talking about. But basically, what we're saying is like you got to get out of that rat race where you're having to work for money whether it's an NFL athlete or whatever your job is, at some point you got to have this passive cash flow coming in and it, it totally ch it changes everything. My, your, my psychology now knowing, all right, I, I just take a deep breath, you know, like I don't have to, I'm probably still going to work because I love doing it. I love hustling, yeah. but just knowing that you don't have to like completely has changed my attitude about what I spend my time on, what matters to me. I get to, you know, you, you're based on not having to sell out for any reason. You could always, if, if a, if a GM of a NFL team says, "Hey, we want you to do this or that," you can say, "Hey, you know, this is this is what I'm going to do." You can you can tell me what you want to do, right? <laughs> so it, yeah, it's absolutely. A, you know, being able to play play the game and not worry about anything but the love of the game is nice because you know once you get in the NFL, it's it's a job still. People people forget that, but you know, there's a, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot of pressure that comes with it, and. And, um, you know, I found being able to, to have that financial independence and that financial security kind of gives you a comfort of like, man, I'm playing this game because I love it. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
I'm playing yeah. this game because I love it, and that's it. I love, yeah. Well, that, that I want to make a transition on that note because you know money money is fun. Like we love you're you're a you're a learner. You're you're a guy who's who goes deep on this knowledge of money and investing. We 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 both enjoy doing it. But what I've gotten from you and just kind of studying your background a little bit, preparing for this interview, is that there's also there's other things in life that matter, right? There's things that you do what matter. And uh, one of the things I was impressed with that I want to ask you about is a couple of years ago, I guess back in 2017, as part of your kind of outreach you know, effort, public public media or social media, you started doing a, a uh, reading with, with DK kind of hashtag on your Instagram channel. <clears throat> and so you were, you were trying to get young kids and just different people to recognize that learning and reading was important. And so I, I'm just curious about that particular program. Like what, what, what motivated you to start doing that when you were uh, in w at whatever point that was in your career to start trying to yeah. reach out to people and encourage them and teaching them to learn and to read? You know, that started for me while I was playing for the New York Giants. I think it was my third uh, year in the NFL. And I just started to realize that people looked at uh, us athletes and, and that's all we were. And, you know, oh, you got to become – like kids feel like you got to become an athlete or an entertainer of some type, or you can't make it, you can't be successful. And, and, um, you know, we're living a video game age where everyone's playing Fortnite and all these different video games. And one of my biggest hobbies is reading. You know, I love reading. I love um, learning. A lot of what I read is personal growth, uh, business, finance, real estate type of books. That's just my interest. But I think reading in general is such a powerful tool. And I wanted them, I wanted people to hear it from an athlete, not, you know, be an athlete that's like, oh, I have a football camp or I do this. Like, no, I really love reading. I really love <clears throat> learning and growing as a person. And I want you guys to come and do it with me. So I started that and I actually got mentioned in the New York Times in my, in my third year. So that was so cool to me because yeah. I'm like, oh, the New York Times. They, um, they, um, they took it and, and showed my program. And I've been doing that for a few years now. And I, this last year, I was actually nominated to be the Walter Payton Man of the Year finalist um, for 2019 when I was in Detroit for my work with after school programs in the Detroit area and promoting reading and, and creating scholarships, um, college, uh, scholarships for kids with the Devon Kennard Scholarship Fund. So uh, that's what I'm about. I, I wanna learn, I wanna grow, I want people to do it with me and being able to provide kids the opportunity to, to realize that there's so many ways to be successful and you don't have to pigeonhole yourself to, um, oh, I gotta become an athlete or I gotta do this. It doesn't matter if you wanna be an accountant, if you wanna be a firefighter, um, go chase your goals and, and be successful and there's a, there's a way to make it happen. So uh, a big proponent of that and that's something I'm passionate about. I love it. That's so, so cool. And I want, if you don't mind, I want to talk about a couple of the books you chose along the way. Um, I think the first, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the first, uh, the first year you did it back in 2017, the two books that you, it was kind of like a you know, reading club, book club. And you said you wanted everybody to read To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee uh, and The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, two of my favorites as well. I just, I, I just remember be, those being real impactful on me at different points in my life. So I, I'm curious just what, what motivated you uh, to choose those two books in particular? Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, it, we're at a time, you know, it's a crazy time in our in our world and in society and in this nation. And I just felt like that was a very fitting book for for what we're going, what we've been going through for the last few years and what we're going through now. And uh, anybody who hadn't read it, I felt like should read it. And, and anybody who has, but maybe it was years ago, should revisit it because there's so many lessons within that book um, that we should all take with us. And The Alchemist is one of my favorite books of all time. So that's why I chose that one. And I feel like finding a personal legend and, and um, you know, your goals in life and, and what you're pursuing is so important. So uh, that book was one that resonated with me as well. So it was just fitting. Those are probably my two favorite books and most impactful books growing up. So um, I wanted everyone to read it or reread it and, and do it with me. Well, I'm going to put links to both of those because I think people who are listening to this, if they haven't read it, um, check those out. Those are both, uh, I, you've inspired me to reread those as well. I've got, I've got the alchemist on my shelf. My wife actually has it in Spanish. So I need, I think I need to practice my Spanish. See if I can read the Paulo Coelho in uh, Spanish. Yeah, that, that'd be even harder, I guess, but I can try to learn two things at once. Uh, but then to kill a mockingbird. Yeah. I just, I remember reading that in high school and it just being, 
you know, the, the story and the characters, of course, and, you know, the, it's kind of through the perspective of a, of a young girl watching your dad kind of go through a trial and there's, there's race relations involved in a small Southern town. And it's just, I mean, it's the power of story in action. I mean, it just, it just shows you, you can, you can touch really tough issues without like making the judgment. The author doesn't try to make the judgment directly on the, the story. It's like you putting yourself in the story and you just looking at it and talking about it. And that's what was so cool about your, uh, your book discussion, you had people making, uh, you know, young kids, grown ups, parents, just having a discussion about these difficult topics and just yeah. looking at them through through literature. I, I think what's cool specifically about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is, is there's ties to what's going on now. You know, if you you read that book and then connect it to stories and things and and what our society and what our country is facing now, and it's like, you know, we're, uh, we've come so far, but there's still so far to come. So uh, to, to take that perspective and, and be like, all right, like, how can I be a part of the solution? How can I be better? How can, um, you know, I not pass judgment on people and treat people fairly and, and recognize the flaws of our, of our government and of, of our society and, and of our personal biases that we all have to some degree. Yep. And, uh, you know, just reflect, reflect on yourself a little bit and, and help make your world a little better, which will make the world overall better. Really well said. And it's, and it's also, you know, not judging yourself. Like we all, none of us are really perfect here, but like, like those characters in that book, you gotta, you gotta recognize when there's things are right and wrong and what kind of difference you can make personally where you are when you can. So, so many good, good lessons. That's, that's just the power to me. The, what I love about what you're teaching people is the power of literature, the power of reading, whether it's, Non nonfiction, self help literature, whether it's something like that, that's just a classic story. Um, there's so much to be learned when you make that habit of of learning and reading, kind of a lifelong li lifelong habit. So let, let's yeah, go, yeah uh, go go ahead. I'm you sorry. look at some of the most successful people. You look at some of the most successful people in the in the world, and you know a lot of them say they they read. You know, so why not follow follow suit and do the same thing? Yep, no doubt about it. So, so one of, there's some other books. I, I'm going to put a link so everybody can kind of check out some of your other ones you put in there. But let, let's fast forward. Uh, 2020, I believe, you had the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book on. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if I think if you randomly interviewed anybody who's in like the financial independence, real estate investing, wealth building space, I mean, who hasn't started with uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? It just it gives you that kind of foundation that you got to think differently. So I'm curious on that book for you, like what, what were some of the, the big takeaways that you both you took away, but also you hoped other people would get from reading the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book? Uh, the biggest thing it made me realize, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what your profession is, you should try to create other streams of income. Um, it can only help you, it can only better your family situation, your, your position. Some people get caught in, I'm a nurse and I don't know anything about that and I don't like, but there's a there's a role that it can play um, in w whether it's real estate. You know, I'm biased. I love real estate, but whatever it is, if it's a small business on the side, there's just so many things you can try to do to to um, you know create other streams of in income for yourself. And if you go and ask any family across the country what they like to uh, an extra thousand dollars, an extra five hundred dollars, an extra ten thousand dollars a month of income outside of their day to day job, I don't think anyone would say no. Right. But you know, so just just actually putting the time and the in the work in to make that happen for yourself and for your family, and just the overall mindset. I think. Um, personally, my personal opinion is the American dream has been kind of misconstrued over the years of now you got to go to college and get in all this debt and then get a job. And now you're stuck in this rut of like, all right, you got a high paying job, but now you're paying a mortgage, a car note and all this money in, in um, student loan debts. And you get stuck in this cycle and, and uh, encouraging people to think outside the box, not that you shouldn't go to college. You know, I got two college degrees, but doing it in a smart way that you, that's uh, works for you and your family and pursuing, uh, um, you know, financial independence and a career path that's going to help you uh, in all areas of your life. I just think it, it's uh, such a limited mindset and we get stuck in this cycle that no one can really get out of. And if you start to teach yourself differently and teach your kids differently, then we can all move forward as, as a country in a much better way. Yeah. 
I, I agree hundred percent. And it, you know, so much of what I took from the rich dad, poor dad, it, some of the critiques sometimes you get from people, they're like, Hey, there's, it's just really basic stuff. Like, you know, the whole book was just like three ideas. And my comment always is like, yeah, it was basic, but like, how come people with PhDs and, and graduate from college and doing all that were making some really not smart decisions because <laughs> they didn't read this stuff earlier on. Like this stuff wasn't taught in school, which is the whole point of rich dad, poor dad. Like his, his, his poor dad was the one who had all the degrees, who had all the college debt, who depended on pensions and things like that for his, his financial security. Whereas the rich dad, at least, you know, the idea of the rich dad was doing everything you just talked about. You got to take care of your own financial security. You got to make some wise decisions and, and you don't have to make crazy like decisions. You just have to make some basic like decisions. That's what Warren Buffett always says about investing. He's like the people who are like geniuses don't always do that well with investing. And I'm not saying that investors aren't smart. What I'm, you know, it's just that some of the decisions you make are more about like willpower and patience and like virtue. You know, you just gotta, you gotta like look at yourself and be some of the same stuff with athletics I've found, right? I don't know if you've found that too. Like the, just being self-disciplined, having good habits, building a good team around you, like all these things that make you a good, you gotta have talent as a football player, but some of those things that you make a choice about, I have found translate really well to starting your own business, investing. Have you found that to be the case as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it reminds me of a quote I, I came across, I can't remember where recently, but it was like, if information was the solution, everybody would be billionaires and have and have an eight pack right now. <laughs> and I heard that and, I, and it just made me laugh because we live in an information age where you can learn just about any and everything simply on YouTube and Google nowadays. Yeah. So it's, it's not about information, you know, it's it's about applying the information you learn. And, and I think another rut you can get into is you learn all this information, but you don't apply any of it, you know? So um, somebody told me the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid, and I'm a, firm, I'm a firm believer in that. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated, but we learn something, apply the simple principles that, that you learn and watch the impact it could have, you know what I mean? So there's simple decisions you can make in your financial life that can make a resounding impact. Um, and people just got to be willing to do it and willing to learn. Cool. Well, along that line, I got a couple more questions before we wrap it up. But um, wh what are some of the, you know, we, maybe we've said some of them already, but some of the simple habits that you would give people advice on? I mean, so we, we got all this information, they listen to this podcast, they listen to other podcasts. Like if you had to break it down and kind of give them the fundamentals, like, hey, here's the blocking and tackling of what you've done so far, like this, where you started getting out of college, getting the NFL, getting you know your money to where you are now, where you have enough income to pay the bills. Like, can you think of just a couple of the fundamentals, the things that were like the kind of big gems that you think should, people should try to replicate? Not necessarily information, but like some of the habits you've done that you, you wish people would yeah, replicate. Well, um, first, I would say, make sure that you're, that you're learning. So whether it's certain books you, you uh, start looking into or podcasts you listen to, but, but learn. I listen a lot to your podcasts. I listen to Bigger Pockets, um, just anything I can absorb. So it starts there because if you don't know anything, it's, it's hard. You know, you're not going to be able to jump into real estate without some knowledge. But once you start learning, take action. Find a way to get into a, a small deal. If you don't have any money, and are you scared to use any of your own money? Look into wholesaling, look into different loan, uh, loans. There's there's ways around everything. So I see so many people give up and like, well, that's easy for you to say, you make all this money playing in the NFL. I've seen and know people who have started with nothing and found ways to get in. So learn and fi figure out what your, um, what your situation is and what you're comfortable with and what options you have. So, um, and take action. It, it start it starts there. So learning and then taking action are two, two huge things and people don't do those two things. And if you don't do that, you can't get off the, can't get off the ground. So those would be the first two. Um, next would be minimize spending, you know, um, and like, if you keep your budget down now, you can provide yourself. All right. If you're making $5,000 a month, but only, but only spending three, all right, now you have extra capital, you can start putting aside for your first investment. So, um, you know, like keep track of those type of things and keep track of where your money is going and wh where it's coming, because that's where you can create a um, create an excess of cash for yourself that you can make, make those moves. And that's something I do even till this day is, all right, where's my spending at? 
because I don't want my, my like the creep effect to happen where you start making more, you start spending more. You can never get really ahead. So um, that's that's a huge thing that I think everybody should take in. And and then next thing is network. I, a, a huge thing for me is networking with people and building relationships. Um, I've been able to accomplish a lot on and off the football field in my life, and I'm grateful for it. But most of it is because of the people I've been able to have around me and the mentors and and the advice I've taken. So if you go and network, you'll be surprised the relationships. That first deal I mentioned to you, if I didn't go to that, um, that real estate seminar, I would, it would have never happened. You know what I mean? But I went there, I asked questions, I stayed afterwards, shook hands. And, uh, you know, a tip with that, uh, that I use regularly is get business cards and remember one thing particular about that person. So for instance, I, um, I meet you, I meet Chad and I know you went to Clemson and you played, played football. Like if we just met next time I shoot an email over to you. If I jot something, jot something down about that, like, Oh, did you see the Clemson game? Like people that resonates and now you stand out. That's a way for you to stand out from everyone else around you. So, um, that's another tip and do something every day to improve. Um, it's so easy to let life kind of take over and you say you have these goals and I'm going to do this or that in real estate, but you don't, you're not consistently doing something to move forward. So that would be the, uh, my final advice is do something every day towards your real estate goals or whatever your goals are really. And you'll be on the right track. Man, I'm impressed, Devon. You just pulled that like out of your out of your head, just like randomly. Five steps or like like gold, <laughs> man. You're just dropping gold right there. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat them just everybody because I, I was taking notes too. You, number one, you got to be a lifelong learner. You got you, it all starts with learning it. Number two, you got to take action. You can't just stay in that learning mode. Number three, you got to be a saver. If you can't ever if you don't ever save any money, you're not gonna ever move forward financially. Number four, you got to network, find a way. And this, that's particularly big. I know I run into a lot of people who are really good at the math. They really good, they have a good job, but they they just they don't feel like they want to put themselves out there and talk to people. And I, I kind of get that sometimes. Like, you know, yeah. I, I, yeah, you just say, ah, I'm tired. I don't want to go talk to people. It's COVID-19. I don't want to get yeah. on Zoom again, you know. But, man, I can't tell you how many – of the good deals and the good relationships I've had where I, I kind of was like on the fence, I don't want to go to that coffee meeting with this person. And then they end up bringing me a 14 unit deal. This made me like a million dollars, like literally right. like one coffee, you know, it's like, what, I mean, I mean how, how can that happen? Every, every deal I've ever done, whether it's the syndications I'm in as limited partners, all the properties I bought, all of it has been through networking and yeah. building relationships and then i'm on this podcast because i was willing to put myself out there and, and yeah. reach reach out to you and network so you'll be amazed at how much that set you apart yep absolutely and then number five it really does all come down to that like if you didn't do anything else if you just like it's kind of like a a, a, a sailboat, you know, like a sailboat trying to get to this other island over there. But if it just, if you're not in motion, like you'll never get there. So it's just, it doesn't matter if you go in the right direction, just do something small something today, like, and eventually do something small, like you did on your first deal, do something, go for a base hit, do a deal. So, I mean, those, those are gold. Those are really, really good. Uh, I'll, I'll put those in the show notes as well, just so everybody can, can walk away with that. Um, all right, so I want to I want to reach back around to like your your own story and 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 ask you a question about post NFL career. Like I hope I hope your career keeps on going for as long as it's possible in the NFL. But I know you're you're thinking always about kind of next steps or where you're going. Where, where do you see yourself? You know, five ten years from now, like what kind of what kinds of things or challenges or do you have a you know any any kinds of uh, causes that you think are, are interesting to you? Like, do you, have you, you what, what, where, where kind of is the ship of uh, Devon Kennard going after this? Yeah, well, you know, God willing, I'll be playing in the NFL for the next three to five years. I've always wanted to hit 10. I just finished seven. So when I at least hit then uh, 10, but I think I might even be able to hit 11 or 12. So next three to five years, I hope I'm still in the NFL. Um, right now, as you know, I've reached the financial independence goal, what that number is for me. Um, so my goals are, I'm kind of scrapping all my old goals and writing new ones. And and now I wanna uh, I have a big goal of doubling my net worth outside of uh, outside of football eventually. So that's a that's a big one, but I, it's definitely possible. Um, so that's that's something I'm gonna start because now I, I know my family's security is, is well. So now 
um, my investment strategy is shifting a little bit. You know, it's not just cash flow um, where, you know, I have all these properties. I'm in all these limited partner uh, deals and syndications. Now I want to start getting into some of my own bigger deals. I'm, I'm beginning to start to look into multifamily units um, here in Arizona and elsewhere uh, and become a general partner in some deals. Buying, uh, I'm going to start out small on my own, really figure it out. So I uh, hope to buy, you know, anywhere from five to 12 unit building this year and, and start stacking from there. And, uh, you know, my goal is essentially to, in the next five to 10 years, own over a thousand units um, and, and be able to own and, and manage those would be really awesome. So those are some of the new goals that I have in mind. Uh, you know, they're, they're monster goals, but, uh, you know, I'm going to start chipping away at it, doing one thing every day and uh, see where it puts me. Love it, man. Thinking big, always got to be moving forward. Really cool. And uh, this has been a really inspiring conversation, Devon. I, I appreciate it. Your, your, your time is valuable. And I know uh, people are going to be really interested to, to follow up with you, to learn more. Maybe you can come, if you're, if you're willing, maybe we'll reach circle back around on the podcast, you know, a year from now or so, see how those kind of things are going and how you're progressing. But uh, if people want to stay in touch with you, I'm going to put links in the show notes as well. But where, where's the best place for people to follow along with you, see what you're up to, see how your NFL stuff's going? Where, where, where can they connect with you? Uh, all, on all social media platforms, you can find me at Devon Kennard, D-E-O-N-K-E-N-N-A-R-D. Uh, I also have my own personal website at Devon Kennard. So it's pretty much my name. You type in my name on any uh, social media or on, on www.devonkennard and you'll be able to find me, see what I'm up to. Don't be afraid to reach out. Um, and I'm excited to connect with you guys. Awesome. Well, you have to fi find out what his next uh, book book reading in the off season will be. So y'all need to stay tuned with that. I'll be on there as well. <laughs> All right. Good. I can't wait. All right. Appreciate it, Devon. Good talking to you. Uh, nice talking to you, Chad. Appreciate it. Right. Take care. Hey, if you like that video with Devon Kennard, I think you'll like my next video, which is about how many rentals do you need to retire? I go step by step through the math and the whole goal is to help you figure out what your personal portfolio number is so that you can eventually have passive income for rental properties. So be sure to check that video out and thanks for watching Coach Carson TV.